Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. The Lord is indeed at work because that song, that special music, completely goes hand in hand with what the sermon is about. I, I've become quite passionate about dealing with conflict and learning how to deal with conflict. And um, I, I had... Sorry, slight. Um, I have a visual aid for you to kind of help uh, us look at the stepping stones that um, will walk us through what I have found to be most helpful with uh, conflict, dealing with conflict actually. Um, so, the, the visual aid will have a set of chairs, and each chair holds a color. And three of those chairs represent our human nature, how we react to those when we are in the midst of conflict. And the next three chairs will be how we can allow the Holy Spirit to come over us and to put on the principles that God would have us live by. Um, I'll go ahead and start with the reds here. <laughs> when the visual aid gets up, you'll kind of understand more how, what the direction is going. Um, and again, I want to stress that each chair is a mental state that we choose to place our mindset in. And when we do that, our body reacts or takes action because we have sat in that chair. Each chair will come with characteristics, whether good or bad. So I'm, I'm going to start with the red chair. The red chair signifies selfish anger. We can have a righteous anger as Christ had in the temple, but this is a selfish anger when we, we respond to someone else because of how they responded to us. As a, an anger that is a hurtful anger towards ourselves and towards others. We have self-righteousness in this chair. We have judging. We have hatred towards others. We have revenge. We have envy, jealousy, playing the victim. If you're in a conflict and you, the common key in every conflict you face is you come from the conflict thinking that this was done to me, that was done to me, how dare they do that? You're playing the victim because in a conflict, it takes two individuals to create conflict. So you can play the victim in the red chair. You can have an accusatory spirit or a critical spirit. And so I'm now going to go through what the Bible says regarding these characteristics. In Ephesians 4.31, it reads, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. In Proverbs 15, 18, we have a wrathful man stirred up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeases strife. There's a number of texts in the Bible that says our God is slow to anger. Praise the Lord. In Psalms 37, 8, it reads, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Encouraging conflict, Ellen G. White writes, Envy is one of the most satanic traits that can exist in the human heart. It is one of the most baleful in its effects. It was envy that first caused discord in heaven. It is the indulgence. Its indulgence has brought untold evil upon men. Every evil Envying and where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. That is James 3.16. In this day with God, 
there's a beautiful quote that says how we are to, to avoid sitting in this red chair. Avoid every, everything in look and gesture, word or tone of voice that savors of pride and self-sufficiency. Guard yourselves against word or look that would exalt yourself or set your goodness and righteousness in conflict with others' failings. Beware of the most distant approach to disdain, overbearing, or contentment. With care, avoid every appearance of anger. Though you use plainness of speech, let there be no reproach, no railing of accusation, or token of the only token of warmth should be that of earnest love. Above all, let there be no shadow of hate or ill will, no bitterness or soreness of expression, nothing but kindness, gentleness can overflow from a heart of love. This is what God would have us to do. Um, so sitting in this red chair is a detriment to our own salvation. We're going to move from the red chair over to the orange chair. This chair, the characteristics make up uh, gossiping, self-praise, because normally when you're gossiping, you're kind of building yourself up because you're saying, this person has done such and such and such. But in a way, you're saying, I would never do such and such. So that sits in the same chair, gossip and self-praise. It's imposing personal opinion. The only opinion we should be imposing is that of Christ. Yeah. It is also over-talking. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 5.3 says, A fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. Psalms 101.5, in speaking of gossiping, is, it is written, Whosoever privily slandereth his neighbor, I will cut him off. Him that has a high look and a proud heart, I will suffer not. Did you notice what was in both? Uh, there was two characteristics in there. There was gossiping, you will be cut off. But then there was a high look and a proud heart, which is almost self-praise. So in a sense, the orange chair makes up both of those. In Proverbs 26.20, it is written, where there is... Where no wood is, the fire goes out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceases. Ceases. Uh, Proverbs 26, 22. The words of a tail bearer are as wounds. They go down into the innermost parts of the, of the belly. Uh, there was a health nugget that we had put on the, the screen once where you could see that the emotions and how it affected the blood flow and the heat, where the heat was retained or its coolness. Does anyone remember that? So the, the wounds of a tail bearer, you can basically poison someone through their own emotions. You can wound horribly. Uh, in education, page 236, uh, in, the in the use of language, there is perhaps no error that old and young are, so, are more ready to pass over lightly in themselves than hasty, impatient speech. They think it's sufficient to excuse and plead, I was off my guard. I didn't really mean what I said. But God's word does not treat it so lightly. The scripture says, Seest thou a man with hasty words? There is no more hope for a fool than of him. That was Proverbs 29, 20. He that hath no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down and without walls. Proverbs 25, 28. In one moment, by hasty, passionate, careless, speech may be wrought and evil a whole lifetime's repentance cannot undo. We can wound so, so badly that even if we are sorry, it doesn't fix the wrong that we have done. Oh, the hearts that have been broken, the friends estranged, the lives wrecked by harsh, hasty words of those that might 
have brought help and healing. In True Education, page 144, this it reads, We think of horror of the cannibal who feasts upon the warm flesh of its victim. But are the results of this practice being gossiping any more terrible than the agony and ruin caused by misrepresenting motive, blackening reputation, and dissecting character? The young should be taught that God says about these things, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Backbiters are classed with the haters of God, with inventors of evil things, with those who are violent, proud, and boastful, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. People whom God account as citizens of Zion are those who speak truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue, nor take up reproach against their neighbors. We're going to move now to the yellow chair. The yellow chair is a little bit different, but it's still, it's still the base of the yellow chair is still the same root as the orange and red chair. The yellow chair is self-degradation, self-hate, fear of another man's opinions. God alone should be what we build our character and our opinion on, not other man's opinion. Also in the yellow chair is fear of failure, feelings of unworthiness, fear of rejection, and lack of self-respect. This yellow chair, even though the words do not affect those outside of us, it affects the, word, the, the inner being. It still can wound in nature, but if we wound ourselves and we wound Christ. The yellow chair, and I know personally because I sit a lot in the yellow chair, is very isolating, and the devil uses this isolation to eat the person from the inside out. And a lot of times, the yellow chair is built upon guilt, and it may not even be the guilt that the person has done. It can be that, but it also can be taking personally the things that other people have done to you and having guilt by other people's actions. So I want to read this beautiful quote from Letter 38, February 24th, 1887. This feeling of guiltiness must be laid at the foot of the cross of Calvary. The sense of, of sinfulness has poisoned the springs of life and true happiness. Now Jesus says, lay it on me. I will take your sin. I will give you peace. Destroy no longer your self-respect, for I have bought you with a price, with my own blood. You are mine. You're weakened. I will strengthen. Your remorse for sin, I will remove. Then turn your grateful heart, trembling with uncertainty, and lay hold on the hope that is set before you. God accepts your broken, contrite heart. He offers you free pardon. He offers to adopt you into his family with his grace to help your weakness. The dear Jesus will lead you on step by step if you put your hand in his and let him guide you. Search for the precious promises of God. If Satan thus threatens before your mind, turn from him and cling to the promises. Now those are three chairs. Thankfully the next three chairs have hope in them. But these three chairs, the root of these three chairs is self. Self keeps us from salvation. So how do we attain salvation? How do we go into conflict and deal with conflict the way Christ would deal with it? How do we put on the nature of Christ and turn our back 
from the human way of dealing with situations. Now, first and foremost, hopefully that we will get to the point where we will immediately, when we see conflict, sit in the green chair. But as of now, even I am struggling to go straight to the, the green chair. So what do we need to do mentally to get from these three chairs of self and sit in the green chair? There's three things. We must have humility to even get out of the chair. We must humble ourselves. The second thing is repentance. We must bring our sin before God and ask for repentance and ask for his blood to cover us. And then, because when we sit in these chairs, we hurt others, it requires an apology. An apology to those whom we have hurt and wounded. And a lot of times, our human nature, the way we apologize, is we say, I'm sorry, but you, such and such and such. That's not the apology that Christ would have of us. The apology that Christ wants from us is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I hurt. I'm sorry I wounded. That was wrong of me. Doesn't matter what anyone else does. Our apology is between us and God, and it, it has nothing to do with the characteristics that someone else is showing us. So, what is the green chair? The green chair is a beautiful chair. The green chair is a weight chair. What are we waiting on? We're waiting on the Holy Spirit to cover us, that we can then proceed to the next chair. The green chair only has uh, two ways of speaking. So there's no outward speaking, and there's no inward speaking. And that, that refers to the yellow chair. There's no inner dialogue. The only speaking there is, is prayer and singing. In Proverbs 10, 19, it says, He that re refraineth his lips is wise. Ecclesiastes 5, 3, A fool's voice is known in the multitude of words. And I want to, I want to read from Review and Herald. Alan White depicts our Savior at the carpenter's bench and how he dealt with conflict. Through the help that Christ can give, I'm sorry. Yes, through the help that Christ can give, we are able to bridle the tongue. Sorely was he tried on this point of hasty and angry speech. Never once, he never once sinned with his lips. With patient calmness, he met sneers and taunts and ridicule of his fellow workers at the carpenter's bench. Instead of retorting angrily, he began to sing one of David's beautiful songs and his companions, before realizing what they were doing, would unite with him in the hymn. What a transformation can be wrought in this world if men and women today would follow Christ's example and use these words. For in many things we offend all, but if men, if any man offend not in word, the same is as a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. That is James 3, 2. And once again, we're not meant to stay in this chair. From this point forward, we should be progressing. So what is the next chair? The next chair is the blue chair. And this is establishing boundaries of divine nature, living the truth unashamedly, meaning you're not apologizing for what the, the choices that you make that are based biblically. It is understanding the word of God and being assertive with it, not aggressive. So are there any boundaries in the Bible? It's actually loaded with boundaries. I'm only going to list a few. Um, this first one I, I, I found rather uh, insightful. Proverbs 25, 17. Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be wary of thee, and so hate thee. <coughs> so don't overstay. Here, you're welcome. Proverbs 26, 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. So don't respond evil for evil. Respond 
evil, good for evil. Proverbs 22, 24 through 25. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man shalt thou not go. Don't seek out someone who's always lashing out in anger. Lest thou be, learn his ways, and, thy, and th get a snare to thy soul. Proverbs 24, 1 through 5. Be not envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. So those who don't live in the principles of what God has ordained us to live, don't seek them out. Don't search for friendship with them. For their hearts study of destruction, and their lips talk mischief. Through wisdom is a house built, and understanding is it established. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. This could go on and on, but do you notice a, pa a pattern? What makes up the boundaries? It is separating evil from good. It is choosing evil and putting away that, and just choosing good and putting away that which is evil. And so we should choose the fellowship of those who are striving for the Master's principles. And how do we know whether or not they're striving and whether or not they, they enjoy sitting in these three chairs that consume our human nature? Remember the three things? The three things was humility, repentance, and a, an apology. So when they are sorrowful for the sin that they, or the hurt that they caused, Councils on Health 107 says our first duty to God and our fellow beings is self-development. That is why we are to choose good and not evil. Because when we are looking at something that is evil, we are attracted and we turn from the good. But if we are looking at that which is good and holy and of God's principles, we turn our back to that which is evil. Praise the Lord, it becomes unattractive to us. So we have to look and keep those around us who are striving for salvation's sake to be at the foot of the cross. Every man has an opportunity to a great extent to make himself whatever he chooses to be. The blessings of this life and also of the immortal state are within his reach. He may build up a character of solid worth, gaining new strength at every step. He may advance daily in knowledge and wisdom, conscious of the new delights as he progresses by adding virtue to virtue and grace to grace. His facilities will improve by use, and the more wisdom he gains, the greater will be his capacity for acquiring. His intelligence, knowledge, and virtue will thus deepen into a greater strength and more perfect symmetry. On the other hand, he may allow his powers to rust out for, what, for want of use or be perverted through evil habits, lack of self-control or moral or religious stamina. His course then tends downward and is disobedient to the law of God and to the laws of health, appetite, conquers him. Inclination carries him away. It is easier for him to allow the power of evil, which are always active, to drag him backward, rather than to struggle against them and go forward. Dissipation, disease, and death follow. This is the history of many lives that might have been useful to the cause of God and humanity. Ministry of Healing Page 459 says, The truths of the Bible received will uplift the mind from its earthliness and deba debasement. If the word of God were appreciated as it should be, both young and old would possess an inward rectitude, a strength of principle that would enable them to resist temptation. Re uh, Ministry of Healing, page 455 the thoughts must be centered upon God. We must put forth earnest effort to overcome evil tendencies of the natural heart. 
our efforts, our self-denial, and perseverance must be proportionate to the infinite value of the object which we are in pursuit. What are we in pursuit of? The heavenly kingdom? The on, only by overcoming as Christ overcame shall we win the crown of life. So that moves us from the blue chair to the purple chair. So the green chair is wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come over you and to cleanse you and prepare you to sit in the blue chair to understand what the blue chair represents, which is the commandments of God, the the um, establishing of good boundaries, knowing what is good and evil, because we don't know. Our, our society is so intermingled between good and bad that we something we think is good is, in God's eyes, evil. So we move from the green chair to the blue chair. So what is the purple chair? The purple chair is loyalty in action. It's empathy, compassion, selflessness, tolerant and patient, seeking to understand others and connect with them, to do for them, making their feelings a priority over our own, as Christ exemplifies. J James 1.22 says, Be ye doers of the word, not only hearers, deceiving not your own selves. Desire of Ages 1.73, When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the lives. Sinful thoughts are put away. Evil deeds are renounced. Love, humanity, and peace take place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness, and the conscience reflects the heavenly light. No one sees the hand that uplifts burden or beholds the light descending from the courts above. The blessing comes when, by faith, the soul surrenders itself to God. In Signs of the Times, May 19, 1890, it reads, Obedience is the law of God. Obedience to the law is the law of God is sanctification. There are many who have errors ideas in regard to the work in the soul, but Jesus prayed that his disciples might be sanctified through the truth and added, Thy word is truth. Sanctification is not an inst instantaneous, but a progressive work. It is obedience. Just as long as Satan urges his temptations upon us, the battle for self will have to be fought over and over again. But by obedience, the truth will sanctify the soul. Those who are loyal to the truth will, and through the merits of Christ, overcome all weakness of character, which has led them to be molded by varying circumstances of life. In which chair do you want to sit? In which chair do you choose to sit? It doesn't mean that we are perfect. We are going to find ourselves in these three chairs over here. But it is what our actions that follow is what makes us strong in Christ. Because it is putting on Christ's character and choosing the principles of life that he established to help us attain victory over the devil. And it's only through this that we will be able to fulfill the last paragraph of the great controversy. I'm going to read it to you. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. An entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness. Through the realms of inimitable space, from the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare God is love. If we are soldiers for Christ, will we not be seen as a loving people? They will say, they will give glory to God that God is love. 
and God is a God that saves us from selfishness to make God 